Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Harris M. Berger. I'm director of MMAP, the Research Center for the Study of Music, Media, and Place here at Memorial University of Newfoundland. I'd like to welcome all of you to this, the first of our two afternoon sessions uh, here at uh, Good as a Concert, a festival of traditional song and story from Newfoundland and Labrador. We have a wonderful session planned for this afternoon, a second one after a break. And this evening, I'd encourage all of you to come to the evening concert. That'll be at the Suncor Auditorium over in the School of Music. It's just here on the Memorial University campus, if you need a map, uh, we have some of those to get you over there. Uh, I'd like to also ask, if you have a moment, if you could fill out a survey. We're hoping to uh, find out what worked from the festival, what didn't work from the festival, and how we can make this a, a, a great event for everyone in the coming years. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Gary Green, who's going to uh, be leading this afternoon session called Ghosts and Gallows. Thank you very much. Oh, well, you've got Thanks, uh, thanks very much, and thanks everybody for, uh, for coming out uh, this afternoon. So uh, we've got a mixture of story and song, and uh, the way we'll do the afternoon is we'll start and work our way across the stage and uh, take turns, and we'll, we might get two rounds through, three rounds through in our time period, whatever, uh, whatever we get. And, uh, and so I'd like to take a moment to introduce uh, the people on the stage. Eleanor Dawson on my uh, extreme left, and um, she has been around for uh, a whole bunch of time, a whole bunch of times. Um, uh, she's one of the founders of the Folk Festival, so if you know how many times the Folk Festival has been run, you can take a guess uh, at her age. And uh, she was uh, brought up in, in the hotbed of, of creativity in, in Newfoundland over uh, Bay Roberts Way, where you had the Russells and all of those people come, uh, come from uh, that part of the world. So just, uh, just amazing here. Mary Ellen Wright uh, came to us from Nova Scotia. She saw the light and moved across the Straits <laughs> and, uh, and has been here for a whole bunch of years and uh, has been involved with uh, folk music of one kind or another for a long time, been performing down at Bjorn and uh, at the Folk Festival here. And for any of you people who do anything with uh, museums and archives in this province, uh, you've come across her for sure. She's one of the, the, the strong anchor points for, uh, for that whole activity uh, within, the, within the province. Tony Power on my right, and um, uh, he's well known to a lot of people around uh, the province. and. Uh, we do a monthly storytelling circle down at Aaron's Pub. Um, and um, one evening, a gentleman came in, and there were a whole series of regular tellers who told the story. And uh, he came up uh, to me and said, oh, can, can I tell one I first time here, all that sort of stuff? And I said, well, sure. You know, it's a, kind of an open mic affair. And he came in, and he got on his date and said, well, I've been you know, a bit of a tourist here for the last two months, and I went up the shore and I met this guy, Tone Pop. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, uh, he's legend up on the thing, as I shouted from the audience, and he says, oh, well, let me tell the story. And it, apparently he met like four Tony Powers going up, <laughs> going, up, uh, oh, going up the shore. So we need to clarify the, who this one is. Uh, he's, he's the Tony Power from Branch and has uh, been working uh, for years out at the uh, uh, Cape St. Mary's Ecological Reserve, reserve and he's up at uh, Mistaken Point uh, these, uh, these days. Uh, comes from a long history of uh, oral storytelling, um, fathers and, and grandfathers and the like by, by kerosene lights um, in the evenings after the homework was done. And uh, he's just had uh, an incredible interest ever since those days in story. Um, tells them, I guess, all around the province at various festivals and, uh, and the like. Um, he's a, a, an avid uh, conservationist and uh, uh, knows a lot about the, the, the local uh, flora and fauna and uh, weaves them into his stories from time to time. Right? Right. Right. So you know which Tony Power you got this time around. <laughs> okay. uh, so uh, there you were. So Perfect. we could start. Great. Thanks. Okay, I'm going to start off with a song called "Lost Jimmy Whalen." 
It's uh, the story. This song is comes from the 19th century. Uh, it's uh, pretty well known England, Ireland, and in the states. And there are many versions here in Newfoundland. As a matter of fact, Mary Ellen sings a version, and Linda sings a version, and they're different than mine. Um, so this particular version that I sing comes from Conception Bay, and it's a story which is a common theme of a of a, a woman whose lover dies, and she's pretty despondent. He comes back to her as a ghost to keep with our theme of ghosts and gallows, but he can only stay for a short period of time, and uh, he has to go back to his grave, and she dies, of course, as the world. It's called Lost Jimmy Whaler. Slowly I stroll by the banks of the river, watching the sunbeams as evening grew nigh. As onward I rambled, I spied a fair maiden. She was weeping and wailing with many a cry. She was weeping for one who is now lying lonely, weeping for one that no mortal may save. While the dark rolling waters around her were encircled, and the grass now grows green over young Jimmy's grave. Jimmy, she cried, won't you come to me, darling? Come to me here from your cold, silent tomb. You promised you'd meet me this evening, my darling. Ere death's cruel angel stole your sad doom, you promised we'd meet by the banks of the river. You'd give me fond kisses as oft times before to hold me again in your strong, loving arms. Please come to me, Jimmy, now come as of yore. Slowly he rose from the banks of the river, a vision of beauty more bright than the sun, with his bright robes of silver around him encircled, and on to this maiden to speak he begun. Oh, why did you call me from my realm of glory, back to this earth that I soon have to leave? To hold you again in my strong, loving arms. To hold you once more, love, I came from my grave. One more fond kiss, love, and then I must leave you. One more embrace, love, and then we must part. Cold were the arms that did her encircle. And cold was the bosom she pressed to her heart. Adieu, then he cried, and he vanished before her. Back to his earth home his form had to go, leaving this maiden alone and distracted, oh, weeping and wailing in sorrow and woe. Throwing herself on the ground, she wept sorely. With wild words of sorrow this maiden did rave, Saying, Jimmy, my darling, my lost Jimmy Whalen, I'll cry till I lie by the side of your grave. She died all alone by the banks of the river to be with her Jimmy, whom she loved so well, to meet him in heaven, her own Jimmy Whalen, in that realm of glory. Forever to dwell. Very well. Oh, okay. I don't sing as much as I used to, but when the kids were small, I sang all the time. I I think uh, I probably sang to them more than I talked to them, and. Songs are really useful for putting people to sleep or walking places or whatever. Um, starting to think about gallows and stuff. One of my kids really used to like what he called bad guy songs. So this was, this was in the regular rotation at our house. This was a very popular bad guy song. It's called Allentine of Harrow. <coughs> 
I am. I have to see if I'm going to get the right key. I am a bold young highwayman. My name is Tyne of Harrow. I come from poor but honest folk near to the hills of Yarrow. Forgetting of a maid with child, for England I sailed over. I left me parents and became a wild and daring rover. Straight to London I then went, where I became a soldier. Resolved to fight Britannia's foes, no sergeant at arms was bolder. They shipped me to a foreign shore, where cannons loud did rattle. Believe me, boys, I do not boast how I behaved in battle. Many's the battle I fought in, in Holland and French Flanders. I always fought with the courage keen, led on by brave commanders. But a cruel ensign called me out, and I was flogged and carted. Cruel the usage that I got, and so I soon deserted. Straight to England I then went, as fast as wind could heave me, resolved that of my liberty no other would deprive me. I crept into the woods by night, by all my friends forsaken. I dare not walk the roads by day, for fear I would be taken. But being of a courage bold and likewise able-bodied, I robbed Lord Lowndes on the King's Highway with pistols heavy loaded. I clapped the pistol to his breast, which set his heart a quiver. Five hundred pounds in ready gold to me he did deliver. With part of my new store of wealth, I bought a famous gelding that over a five-bar fence could jump. I bought him from Ned Fielding. Lord Arkenstone unto his coach, I robbed at Covent Garden. And two hours later that same night, I robbed the Earl of Warren. One night I robbed at Turnham Green, a revenue collector, and what I got I gave it to a widow to protect her. I always rob the rich and great, to rob the poor I scorned, and now in iron chains I'm bound, in doom I now lie born in. It's now to Newgate I'm confined and by the laws convicted to hang on Tyburn trees my fate at which I'm much affrighted. Farewell me friends and countrymen and me native hills of Yarrow. Kind providence shall test the soul of Valentines of Harrow. Okay. Well, anyway, I strongly believe in spirits and ghosts and fairies. Uh, the answers, the lights came on and the ghosts disappeared, but they didn't because they're not looking for them. And now, not that I look for them, they're just there. And uh, people will blame it on, oh, the wind, the cats and everything else. Uh, but too much of it has happened. Uh, that I've experienced and other people have, and uh, some for the spawny, but I believe like some people died and they have unfinished business and they want to send a signal back and we don't see the signs. Uh, we're too blind sometimes, but uh, the signs are there. And uh, growing up in Branch, like, there were so many things happened uh, in the house we lived in, in the woods we cut wood, and there, there was places you wouldn't 
you wouldn't go there in a late evening because not only from the stories passed down, but what was there. And uh, along with everything else, like when I lived in Branch, now living in Trapeci, and I'm hearing so many stories from people uh, that there's things that are unexplainable. I'll tell you one I heard lately. Uh, uh, you know where the floor's ale uh, got broke up near Kepa Hayden? I was talking to a fellow there, I won't give his last name, but his first name is Richard, and he had a, a cabin just inside where the floor's ale broke up and still parts of the boiler on the beach. But uh, in his cabin, like, it's not that old, there's one room he can't go to, like, as off limits to him. And uh, even his cats and animals, they're always sticking up, the, the hair comes up on the back and they're hissing when they, they go near that doorway. But uh, anyway, uh, Richard this night, he, he's single and he had a date for, with this girl and he invited her to the house and he said, I'll cook supper. And he went getting it prepared and uh, you know what? She went into that room and now she nearly broke down the door trying to get out and passed by him the kitchen, went through it and took off and he, he wanted to know what happened, where, where is she going, what she see? And he had to run after and I suppose he caught up to her about two <laughs> miles down the road and she said she see the devil. But uh, in that room, but all kinds of things happen around his property, like out in the yard you see a, a, a man in old dress and uh, the way he, he was worn, he looked like he was dressed in the 1800s and he was just at the edge of his yard every evening. And then, like, he wouldn't go near him, but he got someone to go down another evening and there's lights like jack-o'-lanterns started to come in right to the beach and disappear just when he got to. But his cat was getting vicious too, uh, near the room. One night he said she ran around the walls trying to get out. And uh, even when he sleeps, he says the, the ceiling, like uh, all faces start to appear in the ceiling. Now, uh, I don't know what kind of a drug he was on. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, people would say he was on drugs or drinking, but this has happened constantly to him. And I believe that there's certainly something there and there's more to it. And, uh, you know, that's only one part of it. And there's even a, a woman that appears at night time on the roadside with a lantern. And some people try to stop and pick her up. She just disappears. Have you heard tell of that? Yeah. Anyway, that's that Cap of Hayden. But uh, anyway, it's coming up for Halloween too, and so many other things happens. Like, you do pranks and carry on, but I must tell you this one. Anyway, it's a bit funny. Like, I always had fun with the children and parents coming up the yard. Like, I got on so bad, people started stop coming to the house. <laughs> <laughs> And I had to give away the candy, or was eating it for a month, one or the other. Uh, but we had this goat. Uh, his name was Daisy. <laughs> a after he got done, so we had to change. Anyway, he, uh, he was getting on, like every one of them, they have a, a certain personality, they, every animal. Like, they do different things on their own. But uh, he used to do part of it all, even, my black lab would open the door for him to get inside in the house. <laughs> like I had to change the knobs on the door. <laughs> yeah. And no worries about anyone breaking in, but the dog could. Um, <laughs> uh, even going up the stairs one night, uh, morning, my wife thought it was one of the youngsters going upstairs, and she, uh, she hid under the sheets thinking it was uh, Dylan, and when she lifted the sheets, there was the goat standing up <laughs> looking down at her. And what a tear way trying to get him down the stairs. <laughs> But uh, that's only part of it. With that goat, uh, Daisy, uh, one Halloween, uh, it was getting 
in the coming up for the evening. And I said, oh, gee, what will I do now for the night? And I looked at Daisy and I said, oh, yeah, I know what we'll do. So I had one of them strap T-shirts, them white ones, and I held it on over his legs and down over the body. <laughs> but I was worried about his horns, like, because he, he pucked and I was afraid he'd hurt some of the children or the parents. So there was a garden hose and I cut off a couple of pieces, shoved it down over his horns. <laughs> <laughs> and that made him look real big. Geez, it was about that lame. And uh, you know those divers, they use those little break off things that lights up. Uh, so I had a couple of them tied it like a necklace on them. <laughs> and he was up in the woods, like in our yard, there's trees going down both sides of the driveway. And up in the woods, like, uh, there's no light or nothing. And uh, he, uh, he was pretty contented, you know, eating around the trees. And, and then the first bunch started coming up the yard for Halloween candy, youngsters and parents. And, you know, he loves sweets. <laughs> and he, he, he heard the bags rattling and the candy. Now he tore out of the trees. He was like the Red Roan Devil. <laughs> and uh, he chased after the youngsters and the all dropping candies and everything. And I said, come back, come back. Get you. No, no. And they ran up the road and uh, the girl was eating candies and everything. Uh, so anyone else come, he smelt the candies. And that ended it for the night. But, yeah. Yeah, oh, I, there's, there's so many other things. We had this dog. Uh, yeah, he used to climb ladders, get up on the roof. And, uh, you know, I was looking at people coming along the road. They were staring up at the roof. And I said, gee, what are they looking at? They're seeing something. And the dog was up on the roof. Uh, finally, I found out and took the ladder off the house. And you know what? He got up onto the house after I took the ladder out. <laughs> <laughs> he found his way up through the, the stairs and out on the dormer and got out. <laughs> but you know, all these are little things that happen and animals are so smart, you learn so much. But they see things we do too. We don't, they see it. Like, uh, I don't want to go too long, but there's one more I'll tell. There's a place outside Branch called the River Sticks, S-T-Y-X, a place between the living and the dead. And there's so many other things, like the fairies are there too. Now, they're not just like the, the little people, there's real spirits there, and you'll feel it when you're going through. But I was walking through it with my dad. I was hunting late one evening, and coming from a place called Gold Cove, and I had to, like, it's about three hours' walk, and I was coming through the river sticks and I got to this place, like it's a little meadow in the, an opening in the woods. And I, I crossed the gully and uh, the dog just stood there and he wouldn't move no further. And uh, I was wondering what he was seeing, like he was stood straight looking ahead on the pathway. And I said, come on, shit, come on. And it was getting later, and the wind was coming eastern, and it was wet snow hitting. And uh, if you stayed out too late, they'd send a crowd coming looking for you, so I didn't want to, to be too long. And uh, the dog still wouldn't come. And I was there for some time, and I walked about 100 feet ahead of him. And I said, come on, shit, come on. No way would he start. And then as I went back to him, he started to growl. Not at me, but at staring at something on the path. And the hair started to lift on the back of his neck. And I got kind of worried then. I knew that there was something there that I wasn't seeing. So I, I said three Hail Marys, and with that, he would start wagging his tail, and I came out. Yeah. Uh, well, that's about it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, so... Uh, well, I don't know why he wants to go up to Southern Shore. You know. <laughs> well, there's so many other things, uh, but uh, you'll have to experience it. Absolutely. So, uh, Ghosts and Gallows, and, um, and I guess in the little run across the stage, I left myself out. So my name is Gary Green, and for those of you who don't know me, 
And uh, I'm a storyteller, and uh, I um, tell stories at festivals and other events uh, around the province. And uh, it's a wonderful opportunity to, to travel around the province and hear so many different stories from so many different places and, and uh, um, realize that uh, every place is perhaps not quite as rich as your part of the world in, in fairy lore and the like, but uh, just an incredible um, uh, amount of lore in, the, in this province. So I'll tell you a, a ghost story from uh, St. John's. And um, uh, so some of you may or may not remember um, the St. John's of long, long uh, ago, at least uh, of my uh, mild childhood. And there was a little uh, uh, saying that went uh, along. Um, in, in various parts of, the, of town, when I grew up, there were certain uh, gangs, you might want to call them, of uh, one kind or other groups. You know, some groups <laughs> were, uh, were pretty, uh, pretty tame. And, uh, you know, we met other guys and played baseball up in Leicester's Field and a few <laughs> things like that. But other groups were perhaps a little more tougher in their image. And uh, one, uh, one uh, little group even had a chant. And it went something like this, if I can remember. Um, we are the boys from Casey's Lane. At night we have our fun. But when the policeman shows his nose, up Flowers Hill we run. <laughs> we stand behind the coffin shop. Not coffee shop, coffin <laughs> shop. Right? Behind the coffin shop. Which parlor it was in the downtown, I don't know at that point. We stand behind the coffin shop. We don't know snow or rain. There's no one can hoop up a corner like the boys from Casey's Lane. <laughs> and, and so among that crowd, there was a young fellow by the name of Matt Tillingham. Now, Matt was the daredevil of that group, if ever there was a daredevil. He'd do anything. You bet him a dollar, which in those days was a fair amount of money, and Matt would do it. No problem whatsoever. So Matt, like a lot of the other boys in those days, used to hang out around the old harbor. And for those of you here who are old enough to remember the old harbor, nothing like it is today. It was a bigger harbor, not all filled in with, with um, uh, shops and stuff along the quay, and the old finger piers that were uh, along there. Well, Matt and the other guys from Casey's Lane used to go down and hang out on the waterfront. Matt used to hear all the stories from the sailors. And he was one of these people that was always intrigued by travel and those kinds of things. And those curvy lines of the ships, well, they just seduced him. And one day, he up and ran away to sea, the proverbial story. He spent a fair amount of time at sea, and he would come home. And every time he came home, his family would rejoice that he came back safely. And so they'd throw a little party, one kind or another, have the neighbors and a few of the cousins, that sort of stuff in. Well, this particular time, when he was perhaps 20 odd years old, a relatively young man, but had literally traveled around the world since he'd been about 14 years old, he uh, uh, had a cousin that came along to the family gathering, and she brought along with her a new friend. Kathleen, never been in the Tillingham's house before, and there was a great party going on, and she was amazed with all the singing and the fiddle playing and the like that goes on. But across the room, she spied young Matt. And when their eyes met, it was like that instant attraction. Well, for the rest of the evening, they couldn't stop talking to one another, or that sort of thing. And when the nighttime came that they had to disperse, she reluctantly left the party with Matt's cousin. Oh, on the way home, she talked to the cousin. She said, wow, you know, that fella, what adventures he's had and so on. And she said, well, look, that's Matt. That's me cousin Matt, you know, and he's a bit of a wild character. And if I were you, I'd watch out for him. Well, she wasn't the only one to tell Kathleen that kind of a story, but it made no odds. And she continued to see Matt 
all while he was home from that trip. Time came that Matt went back to sea. Well, that didn't quench the thirst for love for him at all. No, not at all. She wrote him, write a letter to the ship's agent, and the ship's agent would know where the ship was and would forward the letter on. Matt would write back. Sometimes there was a little present, a little trinket perhaps from, from somewhere, a seashell from Barbados or some such place. The next time he came back, well, the love was even stronger. And in a matter of a few days, they had made the decision to marry. Well, this was a bit of a talk between the people. No, you don't get married like that. But they insisted. And so fairly quickly, a wedding was put together. They went up to the basilica and had the wedding. And then as was the custom in those days, they came and they walked back down to the bride's house. And in the bride's house, the groom and all of the men went to one room where they had their pipes and cigars and rum and beer, and told stories of one kind or another. And into another room went the bride and the women. Now, in those days, the particular tip of the women was either tea, sherry, or the favorite of all, gin. And who knows, but the women started telling tales that would make a young bride's hair curl, what she might expect uh, from, the, from marriage. Well, about this time, Matt had tired a little bit of the smoke and the like in his room and had moved into the hallway to see uh, his bride, perhaps through the open door to the other room, and just see what was going on. Well, just as he arrived outside the door, he heard one woman, perhaps fueled a little too much by the gin, recounting how that she had made a silly choice and that marrying a sailor was the worst thing she could ever do. Why, he'd leave her alone most of the time. She'd have to raise the youngsters on her own. <sighs> she would spend all of her time worrying about whether he was alive or dead. Well, Matt heard all of this and didn't want the woman freaking out his brand new bride. And he burst into the room and he told the woman to shut up in no uncertain terms. And then he turned to Kathleen. And looking over there and seeing a crucifix up on the wall, he lifted the crucifix down, placed it in his left hand, put his right hand upon the sculptured body on the crucifix, and said, I, Matthew Tillington, swear to you, Kathleen, that if anything ever to ever happen to me at sea, you'll be the first to know. And if, perchance, there's any way that you'll do it, I will come and get you and take you with me, whether I go to heaven or hell. The women were shocked. They were blessing themselves. They were saying rosaries, Hail Marys, whatever. This was terrible, terrible stuff. Kathleen was unfazed. She walked over and put her hand right on top of Matt's. And she said, and I vow that should you ever come for me, whether it be heaven or hell, I will willingly go with you. Oh, more Hail Marys and blessings and all of that sort of stuff. The days after the wedding, people didn't talk about how beautiful the bride was or how wonderful the flowers were. They talked about the death pact between the bride and the groom. The buzz of the town. Well, sometime later, Matt goes back to sea. <coughs> Weeks turn into months, months turn into a year or more. <coughs> Mrs. Clary, who lived across the street from the Tillington's house. For Kathleen had done again what was the custom of the day when her husband left for sea, she moved in with his family so that his family could look after her. Mrs. Clary looked out just as the evening was starting to phase down and she saw a figure coming up the street Oh, couldn't quite make out his features, but from the walk, oh, I say, that's Matt. 
Now she had raised Matt, so to speak, across the street. He grew up from her, grew up with her own children, and she went out on the front porch to greet him. She stood on the front step and waved. He didn't wave back. Well, perhaps it's not him, she said. But as he got closer, there was clearly his features. That's him. And she went to go and wrap her arms around him, and it was like her feet were stuck, stuck to the front step. She couldn't move whatsoever. He came closer, and she called out, Matt, Matt. He gave her a sideways glance, but kept going up the steps of his own house, opened the door, closed it. She still couldn't move. A matter of two or three minutes went by, and the door opened again. And this time, Matt appeared with Kathleen in his arms. She's sure it's the two of them. She called again, but no answer from either one. They passed in front of her, went down Casey's, and she watched them till they disappeared around the corner in New Gower Street. It was only then that her feet were able to move. As you can imagine, she was thinking all kinds of wild and perhaps wonderful things, and she ran across the street and knocked on the door. No one came. She knocked a little harder, and Matt's sister came and opened the front door. Yes, what do you want, Mrs. Clare? Thinking up some excuse, oh, I need to talk to Kathleen. I need to talk to her about something. Is she there? Oh, upstairs. She's up in her room, uh, reading or something, I suppose. Kathleen, Kathleen! No answer, no answer. Kathleen! Nothing. Uh, she said sometimes she goes up there and closes the door, or so I'll go up and see. So up she went. 30 seconds later or so, there was a scream. Well, all hands rushed out of the front porch and went up over the stairs. And there, lying across her bed, was Kathleen, face down, her long, beautiful flowing locks ending in a pool of water by the side of her bed, water that contained things that looked like seaweed. Everybody gasped. And for Mrs. Cleary, and perhaps many others, that was proof enough that the wedding bow had been fulfilled, the ghosts of Casey's Lane. So this, this song is called Lady Margaret, and a uh, similar theme uh, to um, the last song. It's, um, this story also, this song also is an old song. Obviously, it probably comes from England uh, from a couple of centuries ago, but it's uh, told, sung in a lot of places in Newfoundland. And it's interesting, I've heard um, a British version of it, and it, you, you know, it's, you'd hardly recognize it. The words change as people, you know, uh, over the years, people put different words in, and the tune is a little bit different. So this is a Newfoundland version called Lady Margaret, and again, it's the story of uh, a ghost who comes back because of some unsettled business. Lady Margaret was sitting by her window one night when a knock came on her door. Lady Margaret arose to see who it was it never had done before. Is it my aged father, she said, or is it my brother John? Or is it my own true love from Scotland lately come? I'm not your aged father, he said. I'm not your brother, John. But I am your own true love from Scotland lately come. 
Did you bring to me any piece of gold? Did you bring to me any ring? Did you bring to me any token of love that a true love ought to bring? I brought to you no piece of gold. I brought to you no ring. But I brought to you the winding sheets that I was buried in. I have a request, Lady Margaret, he said. I had a request of thee. Will you give me back my faith and troth that I did pledge to thee? Your faith and troth I'll not give back nor any other thing until we go to yonder church you wed me with the ring she vexed her petticoats up so high she pulled them above her knee over hill and dale in a dark stormy night in a dead man's company they came at last to the old churchyard where the grass was growing high. Here is my bed, Lady Margaret, he said, and here's where I must lie. Is there any room at your head, she said? Is there any room at your feet? Is there any room at your right side? where I might lie and sleep. My father lies at my head, he said, and my mother is at my feet, and the three white hounds at my right side keep me from my sleep. One is for my drunkenness, the other is for my pride, and the other is for the fair pretty maid who should have been my bride. She took her handkerchief in her hand and placed it across his breast. Here is my faith and troth, she said. May God take you to your rest. I bid you good night, Lady Margaret, he said. I thank you kindly, and whenever the living do pray <coughs> for the dead, I pray you pray for me. <laughs> I just love the flow, the melody, the, yeah. the, the pureness yeah. of the oh, it's just fascinating. Yeah. Absolutely wonderful. <clears throat> you should be thankful I don't do much singing. <laughs> <clears throat> well, I'm going to hold up the end of the bad guys here. Now I'm going to sing another bad guy song. I learned this one from a, a tape we used to have in our car, Baxter Ware and Buffett Double. And we used to listen to Buffett Double all the way up from St. John's to Pettifort, which is three and a half hours. All the way back in from Petty Fortress and John's, on the loop, over and over again. One time I stopped in Arnold's Cove and I went into the grocery store there. And who should I run into but Baxter Ware himself. And I said, Baxter, I said, I've been all the way out to Petty Fort with you and I'm going all the way back into town. I said, I spend more time with you in the car than your wife does. <laughs> he says, it's a wonder you don't shoot me. <laughs> but we don't have a gun. <coughs> anyway, <coughs> this is another bad guy. This is uh, Donald Munro, as we say in our house. Oh, isn't that funny, you know? Start me off a little. Uh, a, bunch of, okay. a bunch of young men who, who were inclined for to roam to see the employment and pleasure find none among the bold number stood Donald Munro and into America 
how they were forced for to go. He left his two sons with their uncle to stay, for he was not able their passage to pay. The So, boys, be contented, stay home in good cheer. Those boys being discontented and troubled in mind to stay with their not inclined. They shipped on a voyage to sail over the main in hopes they might see their poor father again. They landed in America, took a boy for a guide. In search of that country where the dear father lied, together they rambled till they came to a grove where the green leaves and branches appeared for to move. Those two highway robbers were hid in the wood. They pointed their pistols where the two robbers stood. They planted their bonnets in their lily white breast and rushed on their victims like savage wild beasts. Oh, you hard-hearted monsters, oh, you bloodthirsty hounds, you might not have shot us till the one we had found. We're in search of our father, he's the one we love dear and we haven't seen them for seven long years the old man looked at them with a tear in his eyes the old man looked at them with a sad, sad surprise. Here's a curse on my arrow for the deed I have done. Now cursed be my fortune. If I've murdered my son, and who is that young man lies dead by your side? Who is that young man? The old man replied, It's my brother, it's your 
younger son. Now cursed be your fortune for the deed you have done. Don't tell our dear mother that we're lying here. It would only distress her, cause her great despair. We're in hopes for her to meet her on a happy shore where you won't be able to shoot us no more. I'm always amazed at the ballad singers and for one, you know, being able to sing a song that can last 10, 15 <laughs> or more minutes, yeah. and, and the power of the voice, you know, it, it, it really, to me, it really, you know, resonates out. You know, all good stuff, a lot of skill in, uh, in doing that. Well, so, yes. <laughs> well, I'm not a singer. If I start singing the gulls of the evening, <laughs> but I, I wish I could sing. Uh, but uh, lovely voices from both ladies. And, you know, I'd love to have you at a, a time. <laughs> anyway, uh, I must uh, share a couple of other little stories. Uh, do you want to hear about fairies or ghosts or <laughs> what would you like? Uh, My father-in-law always called them the good people. The good people. He never called them anything else, and he didn't call them that very often. <laughs> well, uh, I respect them, but they're not good. <laughs> they're evil out our way. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and always doing pranks, and you know, uh, there, there's people uh, really had bad experiences. Like if you went berry picking or anything like that, some people were missing for days before they returned but they couldn't have no memory of what happened them. And other people like going hunting, uh, dog hunting in the winter and uh, where it was much fresh meat, any either ducks or gambers, we call them out home, coming close to shore. You know, the, the hunters that had uh, the one shot, the muzzle loaders, they did want a good shot in the, because they wouldn't get a second chance. Anyway, a couple of people uh, told me this, that uh, they're dead now. Uh, one by the name of Tom English, and uh, he went dock hunting one morning, like they'd have to leave before daylight to get to a point uh, where the ducks were fishing in, and you know, there was flax up to a thousand, sometimes uh, we call them a bed of ducks. Anyway, uh, he knew they were fishing there, so he said he'd go early and get a shot at the break of day like there. But uh, he had to cross this gully before he, he went out there. And uh, there was a gully called Pismer Gully. I suppose the way it ran over the cliff, it was called the Pismer Gully. And, uh, <laughs> but he got to this and he was stopped. Like there was a, a wall right in front of him, but and he, it was invisible. He couldn't get through. and. That didn't stop him. He walked all the way up around it, probably a quarter of a mile. And he went out another pathway. And when, it, when he got to where the ducks were fishing, they were moved off and he never got a shot. So he returned and he told his next door neighbor, Mr. Jackie Mooney about it. And Mooney's they call him, but Mooney's out home. And, uh, he went telling him about this wall he came up against there in the Pishmar Gully. But Jackie never paid no attention to it, so he uh, got out ready the next morning and said he'd have a shot at the ducks. And when he got to the same spot in the, uh, the Pishmar Gully, he was stopped by this wall. And the same thing he had to do, he had to keep going and trying to get through the wall. He couldn't get through. He had to go way up around 
and uh, found another pet and met his way. You know, and these people uh, just continued out their, their daily uh, chores and everything else, but they knew there was something always there. And so many other things happened, like uh, Mother told me this story about a, a woman, uh, Mrs. Jalmoni. She uh, had cows down in the, the little meadows. Now, that's right where the river Styx runs out. And uh, she was going down to milk her cows this evening, and she didn't go to Sobeys like we do now. <laughs> Uh, but uh, when she got down there, she see all these children down, just running and dancing around in a circle. And uh, the thing about it now, uh, they started jeering at her, and that made her really upset because she was a midwife and born most of the youngsters in Branch. And she said, "Ye sassy snats, I born ye." <laughs> <laughs> And she went on down and milked her cows, but they didn't follow her, but they kept jeering at her. And she noticed that they all were wearing the same outfits, red caps and green outfits, and, but they were only the size of a two-year-olds, she said. And anyway, when she went back to Branch, she was really upset about it, and she went telling the crowd in Branch about the sassy youngsters that were jeering at her. But uh, the wall accounted for like all the children that were in the community and uh, she then realised that it was fairies. But uh, you know, that was way back then and, and I'd say about 15 years ago, a friend of mine see something really strange. Driving out, have you drove out to Cape Shore through Placentia? Well, there's all hills up and down. And there's two places out there, Little Barrow's Way and Big Barrow's Way. Between that, there's a graveyard in Halfway Brook. Anyway, it was around three o'clock in the morning and she was driving out and uh, wanting to get home. But when she came to Halfway Brook, her lights were on high beam and she flicked them down to low beam. And right on the shoulder of the road were these children, all standing up. And then they walked in front of her car and kept going. And she flicked her lights again on high beam. And one of them looked at her. What a vicious look he gave her. Like a frightened the life out of her. And she, she couldn't believe what she was seeing this hour of the night. And you know what? The aunt started walking across the road right into the graveyard. Now, she'd never be caught on that road in the night time again. And... Uh, you know, there's something more to it, for sure. And there's so many other things happened, but sometime, if you ever get a chance, uh, I could take you down to the River Sticks, but respect it too. I always have respect. Oh, there's one fly I took down there, like uh, on a hike, I always do these hikes, down through mostly myself, but this day I, I said I'd take this fella, down there, and you can ask him if you like. He, he runs the performance series at Delph at Cape St. Mary's. And uh, we were coming up through uh, the river Styx and uh, there's a place, the Little Meadow, and he was too loud, like not being quiet enough or respectful enough, I felt. And I said, boy, be quiet, will you? And, uh, <laughs> and uh, no, he wouldn't shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He kept talking, and uh, all of a sudden, there was something come out and give him the biggest push ever. Like, he didn't get time to put out his hands. He was dropped right down into the bar. <laughs> and, uh, like, when I look back and he raised up, his face was covered. <laughs> No, he, he stopped talking after that. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, that's about it. <laughs> oh. <clears throat> and for those of you who don't know Delph, <laughs> He's about, about six five or yeah, something. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a, a very tall man, right? And uh, so for him to go 
down in the bag and locked him in a sight. Yes, yeah. <laughs> and he didn't have a white shard after that. No! <laughs> <laughs> uh, but if you don't believe this part of it, just think of it sometime you're talking to Delph and, and just ask. <laughs> okay. Sorry. I saw him yesterday, so if I'd have known this yesterday, <laughs> yeah. I could have, could have gotten verification on this. Yeah. One. Right. So uh, let me uh, let me do a uh, another story, and um, uh, let's see where I thought. I'll do um, a, 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 a ghost story of sorts. So it's about another power. And, and, and this is a lady by the name of Eleanor Power, um, who came over from Ireland in 17 something or other. And uh, so she came over much as the Irish did in those days as an indentured servant. And uh, uh, the way it went, for those of you who may not be a little familiar, St. John's was, was largely um, governed, there was no formal government, but largely governed by a series of English uh, governors and merchants. And uh, uh, even though about 70% of the population in St. John's and surrounding area were Irish, Roman Catholics, um, they, generally speaking, didn't own businesses of one kind or another, and they came over working for one of the, uh, the English uh, firms. And this was um, Eleanor's case. And she had come over being uh, a chap by the name of uh, Cain, magistrate. He was a magistrate here. He administered the laws. And he was a very influential and wealthy fish um, business owner. And he had a premises at the bottom of uh, what is now Prescott Street, um, where the hotels are there, was his fishing premises. And he had a country home out in Kitty Vitty. And so he was very well to do. He spent the summers in Kitty Vitty and uh, the winter times on uh, um, St. John's. And, and was the custom in those days, the merchants lived above their shops. So it was a two-story two uh, affair, at least. Well, Eleanor came over, and Eleanor uh, was perhaps a little bit of a, a wilder character than Cain would have liked to have had. He ran a very strict household. After the day's chores were done and the shop was shut up for the night, he had prayers. And after prayers, all the members of the household were expected to go to bed. Bright and early the next morning, up to do the chores. Well, this was a little too constraining for Eleanor. And so, one evening after everybody was gone to sleep, at least so she thought, out she went and had a time down on Water Street of those days, taverns, I assume, whatever, and then went to go back. Well, I guess Cain had gotten up sometime while she was gone, perhaps go to the privy or whatever, and had locked the back door again. So when she arrived back, there was no way for her to get back in. It was a cool evening, and she had no choice but to beat on the door. So she woke somebody up to come down and let her in. It was Magistrate Cain who took none too kindly to being woken up in the evening. And he beat her mercilessly with a stick. That put the vengeance in her. Well, she was determined now to get out every night. And she managed to wiggle around with the lock on the back door such that from the outside she could insert a knife and flick the latch. And so she did, for some time, carry on like that. When he moved down in the summertime, she went down to Kitty Vitty and did exactly the same thing in Kitty Vitty. Well, time went by, years, and she had served her servitude. 
and was a free woman. She married a chap power from out in Blackhead, a fisherman. Now, unfortunately, he was a little bit of a drunkard as well and probably treated her worse than Cain did. She took to making spruce beer and serving rum up to the sailors and the soldiers that came out from St. John's to have uh, a, um, a time out in Blackhead. And historical note aside, at that time there were nine, something like nine houses in Blackhead, six of which were taverns. All right, that'll give you some idea of the, the service and when it was going on out there. So one of these evenings, when there were several sailors and soldiers in the room, and they were having chats, Eleanor got on to telling them about Cain and his extreme wealth. Oh, they'd like some of that, they said. Gold he keeps there, silver he has. And so around that table, perhaps fueled by the spruce beer and the, and the rum, a plan was hatched to go and steal from Judge. A little while later, they get in the boat, sail over to Kitty Bitty, and are about to go into Cain's premises when they notice that there are a bunch of fishermen gutting fish on the stage heads around Cain's property. They call it off and go back to Blackhead. About two weeks later, they come back again, this time overland, only to discover, just as they arrive, that Magistrate Cain's son is arriving at the wharf. No go. The third time they come back, and there's nobody around. Eleanor takes a knife and flicks up the rear uh, door, and in they go. There's a couple of soldiers among them, but other than that, it's fishermen from Blackhead. They get in there, and Cain's asleep in his room, and put the hand underneath the bed and drag out the strong box. They beat it out of the house very quickly, get into the woods and beat off the lock open it up, and there's two bottles of brandy and a couple of bottles of rum. <laughs> They're disappointed. Where is the treasure? Well, since they got this, they might as well drink it. And they fuel themselves with the rum and the brandy that was in the cave, in the, uh, the cask, and then decided, well, there has to be another one. And they went back in. And sure enough, there was a second strong box under the table, or under the bed. And they say, drag it out. I guess it squeaked in some way. Cain woke up. Murder, murder, I'm being robbed, he started to shout. <coughs> One of the men had the tip of a scythe as his weapon. And he drove it into Cain several times. And the blood came out all over the bed. And just to make sure, one of the soldiers took the butt of his musket and gave him a few quick raps in the head. Out they ran. Beat open the case, and sure enough, bags of gold and silverware from the house. Off they dispersed. The next morning, when the maid came, she discovered Cain in this state I've just described. Well, she screamed, and others came running. They were sure he was dead, but he made a few moans. He was alive. And they talked to him. He knew who the who the people were. He could identify Eleanor. He knew some of the soldiers that were in the garrison. Well, very quickly, people were dispensed to arrest them. They did a raid out in Blackhead, elsewhere. Well, in a matter of days, they had them all rounded up, 10 of them in total. The trial was held. Cain died, by the way, after he had identified the people for murder. Eight of them were convicted to be hung in two days' time. The two that did the murder itself were also uh, told to be uh, put in chains up on the Gibbet Hill. 
And that was gibbeting. They dropped the body in terror, wrapped it in chains, and hung it up. Eleanor and her husband, though, were hung the next day on Cain's Wharf, right where those hotels are now at the bottom of Prescott Street. They cut the bodies down and buried them right there. So sometime, if you're standing on the corner of Prescott and Water on a cool evening and you feel something around your ankle, you just might be Eleanor reaching up to grab <laughs> Thank you. I'm mindful of the time. We've probably got the time for two more ballads to wipe up the evening. Sure. Okay. okay. So there we go. Uh, so this one I'll do is about gallows. Uh, this is a story which this song in Newfoundland is called Four Marys. It's a song that came from Scotland where it's called Mary Hamilton. And it's a story of um, a Mary who is a servant. She's the lady in waiting to the queen. And by some some, something, she becomes pregnant uh, by the king, and for that, uh, she is sent to the gallows. It's called Mary Hamilton, another happy story. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's yeah. gallows and yeah. graves. So. <laughs> word is to the kitchen gone, and word is to the hall, and word is off to madam. The queen, and that's the worst of all. That Mary Hamilton's born a babe to the highest steward of all. Arise, arise, Mary Hamilton, arise and tell to me what thou hast done. Thy wee babe, I saw her weep by thee. I put him in a tiny boat and I cast him out to sea that he might sink or he might swim, but he'd never come back to me. Arise, arise, Mary Hamilton, arise and come with me. There is a wedding in Glasgow town, this night we'll go and see. She put not on her robe of black, nor her robe of brown. But she put on her robe of white to ride into Glasgow town. And as she rode into Glasgow town, the city for to see, the bailiff's wife and the provost's wife Cried out and alas for thee. Oh, you need not weep for me, she cried. You need not weep for me. For had I not slain my own wee babe, this death I would not see. Oh, little did my mother think. When first she cradled me, the lambs I'd walk to gallows, and the death I was to see. Last night I washed the queen's feet and put the gold in her hair, and the only reward I find for this. The gallows to be my share. Then by and come the king himself looked up with a pitiful cry. 
Come down, come down, Mary Hamilton. Tonight you will dine with me. Oh, hold your tongue, my sovereign leech, and let your folly be. For if you'd a mind to save my life, you'd never have shamed me here. Last night there were four Marys, tonight there'll be but three. There was Mary Eaton and Mary Seaton and Mary Carmichael and me. Four Marys. So you're going to take us out. Okay. Well, I got one more bad guy. He never made it to the gallows, or at least not, as far as we know, from this side. But he did get into the lockup. But he was never going to go back to the lockup again because he was going to be a good boy and go rambling no more. <laughs> oh, my father, he died, left a noble estate. Ah, oh, he married my Rogers, and her fortune was great. In drinking and gambling, I spent all my store. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. In drinking and gambling, I spent all my store. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. There was Anthony Rogers, Joe Fagan, and I. And Twenty-five of us belong to one gang. We'd stay up till midnight and make the town roar. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. We'd stay up till midnight and make the town roar. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. Oh, the jail, it was open, and there I was sent. With stone walls around me to my heart's content. Midst rogues and pickpockets, I lay on the floor. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. Midst rogues and pickpockets, I lay on the floor. I'll be a good boy, I'll rambling no more. I was glad of cold water instead of strong rum. I was glad of the stone for to lay my head on. I was glad of the crumbs as they fell on the floor. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. I was glad of the crumbs as they fell on the floor. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. The jail, it was open and I made my escape. Over stone walls and valleys for my Molly's sake. Now that I have my liberty as I had before, I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. Now that I have my liberty as I had before, I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. I'll go home to me Molly, me dear loving wife. I'll support my dear children for the rest of my life. Here's a curse on the man who puts his wife out of door. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. Here's a curse on the man who puts his wife out of door. I'll be a good boy, I'll go rambling no more. <laughs> and if you believe that, You had the whole room sort of moving around. <laughs> 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 Those bad guys off. <laughs>
<laughs> you can see why kids like it. Oh, absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So that pretty much takes us uh, to our time uh, here, folks. And uh, again, I'd like to thank Eleanor and uh, Mary Ellen and Tony for just a great afternoon. And Gary. And thank, thank you guys Gary. for uh, coming as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.